Hey strangers, welcome to another episode of the Strange Sessions, or TSS, as they call it in the prison yards. Oh, wow. Yeah. How do we, you know this? I, Are I, you getting jail mail? I, I have a snitch. I have an informer. <laughs> Snitches get stitches, Kurt. <laughs> and end up in ditches. I know. Listen to podcasts. I have an informer. Um, And we are coming to you live from... Krista, you want to tell them what Drum it is? Roll. Uh, we have decided to name the studio. We just went with our own name, and it's going to be the Strange Cellar. It is the Strange Cellar. Yep. We went we, before because it's a basement. Before we recorded, we were when we were talking, saying that we were going to say that we did a road show and people were going to vote for the name in and, Lithuania. No, it was in Slovakia. Oh, Slovakia. Because we are Sorry. apparently very big in Slovakia. I got my ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're a big hit in slovakia we are guys. yeah like we're doing pretty good in slovakia <laughs> so thank you all our slovakian listeners i'm czechoslovakian so are I am, you? yeah i am partly nice. slovak so slovakian wow you're slovakian uh, very slovakian <laughs> wow we're starting it off with a bang <laughs> how are you krista and i it, it was funny because neither of us told each other that we were going to wear our caps yep that were given to us by the awesome jeremy Ryder. I, I keep wanting say to say Ritter. Ritter i don't know He's but, told us. I know. Thank I think you he so said much. it right when he joined the strangers, but that was a bazillion years ago. But yeah, ago. it was funny because I pulled into Krista's, uh, what do you call where somebody pulls into? It's I'm, called a driveway. <laughs> I'm totally blanking on that. <laughs> wow. My mind went somewhere else. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it clean. I have students listening. Sorry. Um, But I pulled into the driveway and then she came out to the garage and we both had our our caps on so thank yep. you so much jeremy we had a moment it was fun it was cute uh gonna and give some photographic evidence check yes, the instagram do. and the Facebook. yes we do gonna give some shout outs to our newest strangers and those are ben doherty sarah juden hussein hugo garcia devin martin dan cooper which i don't think is db cooper but mm. his profile picture on facebook is him parachuting Ooh. so maybe the plot thickens. if you are db cooper let us know hmm. come on for Does an interview he look like he's like 90 no he looks <laughs> oh. young <laughs> okay. so maybe 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 maybe, maybe, like botox. Baby maybe botox oh sure yep time travel could possibly okay um joe mastis mastis olivia marie specio linda marie pilcher jacob lloyd Jessica Sawyer, Patrick Duzinski, Marie Frost, Kathy Myers, Brittany Schultz, Madeline Lathrop, Michelle Hines, Amber Good Bevins, Auburn. I like the name Auburn. A U B R Y N N. Auburn Elliott, Kit River, Nate Dang. Giacobucci, wow. Giacobucci, Brooke Perez, who just joined, just joined like, like literally two like minutes two minutes ago. before we started recording <laughs> yeah. the episode. That's a long list. And finally, I want to give a shout out to Cadence Coda, who is one of my students. What's up, Cadence? Um, she is, you know, I, I work mostly with sixth grade, but I also monitor a seventh grade lunch and an eighth grade lunch. And she's one of my eighth graders. And I was warned when I went there, like, watch out for the eighth graders, watch out. <laughs> but I I got the lucky draw because my eighth graders are so awesome, That's like awesome. so cool. And I mentioned something about the podcast Thursday. And then she she asked me what it was called again, and, and she wrote it down. And then later that day, she messaged me that she listened to the Empath episode. Oh, nice. Yeah, which was cool. That pulls a lot of people in. And I totally, 100% could see her being an empath because yeah. she just gives me that vibe. But, oh, I'm, I should say what she said because it was actually really, really sweet. Um, So she said, I sent her the Strange Sessions bingo picture. She was amused by that. But which she, one? Season one or... Oh, well, I think just whatever. season the first one. I didn't send her the second one yet. She's not ready for that She's yet. not ready for that. She's a newbie. <laughs> She's a noob. Oh, that was my throat. Did you hear? Wow. <laughs> that sounds like my stomach. It did. Your throat and my stomach. Possessed. Um, so I, I asked her what she thought of it. And she said, as a professional podcast fan, I love it. It has all the aspects I personally look for when listening. You two are great hosts. And so far, I love the duo you make. I'm super Aww. excited to get deeper into the episodes as well. Thank She's you. so awesome. She's somebody that I would I would actually be like legit friends with in yeah. real life, you know. And, uh, and it's funny because she 
mentioned a podcast that we're both addicted to. And a couple months ago, it showed up in my suggested YouTube videos, mm. and it is Good Mythical Morning. Oh, like, cool. I love Good Mythical Morning. They do mostly taste tests and oh, stuff really? like that. Yeah. That's fun. Like, they do cool things Sounds where... Sounds uh, familiar. Where they, uh, cause that's what I told her like in later episodes, we do taste tests and she's like, oh, kind of like good mythical morning. And I'm like, yeah, I love good mythical morning, but they do things like they get like the store brand Doritos and mm. they're, they're blindfold taste tested oh. and they have to choose which one is the actual Dorito. Oh, I like that. And the hosts, Rhett and Link are really like, I like just feel happy when like when I turn on an episode and they're there. So I, f I feel like that's how some people feel about us. I think so too. So I just think that's awesome. We got a really nice email that we're saving for the... Yeah. Listener submission episode, yes. but oh, such good feedback. Yeah, we've Very gotten, nice. and we've had so many people join in the last <clears throat> yeah. week. I, that list shocked me. I didn't know that many people had joined The Strangers. Yeah, That's crazy. quite a few, quite a few. And then like, you know, I talked to Corey yesterday and Corey said, that, you know, you and I have talked about this. Like it's one of our, where other podcasters would love this. I think you and I are afraid of it is somebody relatively big, like maybe yeah. a Jim Harold or some or or oh my God, that would be amazing. mention us and all of a sudden yeah. we're going to get slammed, right. you know, or, or David Politis. I yeah, mean, he has know. to know we're here because so many people come we to us because they search for missing 411 yep. podcast. So I hope he doesn't hate us. Oh, probably not. We're, we're advertising for him basically yeah. free advertising. Hey, speaking of Jim Harold, the, my podcast that I'm obsessed with right now is the secret room. It's not even remotely paranormal related. It's basically... The tagline is like, it's a podcast about the stories no one ever tells. So people tell something secret that has happened to them. The secret room. The secret room. I'll have room. to look for that. It's so good. I mean, it's everything you can think of under the sun. Someone's got a secret that they've only told maybe one or two people or nobody knows. And they tell their story on this show. But anyway, he, in one of his like little ad breaks... He does a, a recommendation for Jim Harold's campfire. Yeah. Which I thought was really cool because I've been listening to Jim Harold. It's been a while, but he's been around since like 2009. Yeah. That's a really long yeah. time in the podcast yep. universe. Yes, and I love his stuff. Yeah, it's good. I still listen to his to Jim Harold stuff sometimes, but not I haven't been going for walks, so I haven't been mm. listening to much of anything. Well, it's gonna be like fifty degrees today. So. I know. I know. I'm supposed so to go exciting. down to West Bend to Aaron, so hopefully we're sitting outside. I can have a beer. Yeah. I think we might throw our pizza on the grill tonight. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Jim's home. Jim's home. It wouldn't be the strange sessions without some weather talk. Yep. So, <laughs> yeah, we still have like two we feet of snow. We weren't hundred percent sure if I was going to be able to come today mm -hmm. because there was supposed to be some like snow and stuff last night, but it ended up being okay. Yeah. So the weather gods were with us. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other house? Some other housekeeping? You wanted to talk about the mugs? Oh, I do want to talk about the mugs. I actually wrote stuff. Down. Oh, before we get to that though. Uh, I mentioned it, I think, in the last episode that Beth, oh, yeah. the awesome Beth, sent us some artwork mm -hmm. that we want to use for a t-shirt mm -hmm. or merchandise. And I'm going to probably just reveal that like in between episode, like podcast episodes. So okay. there's something yeah. people can be excited about when we're not there. Yeah. And well, this is kind of related to the mugs, actually, because we do have some money now in PayPal and Venmo that I could probably put towards an online merch store now. Sweet. So then we can actually use this artwork Sweet. for some that merch. That is awesome. Yeah. So speaking of mugs. Because Beth asked us if we talked about it and I said, you and I are kind of, you've been super busy with work, so we haven't really talked a whole lot. Yeah. But I think and we're, we're kind of Just when it was slackers. slowing down, I'm getting slammed again. We're so. kind of slackers a little bit. Krista got summoned for jury duty for yes, the month you of did. March. Because yep. she doesn't have enough on her plate right now. Just show up drunk. Thing and... <laughs> Just walk in. Guilty. <laughs> guilty, guilty, guilty. I don't know. I, I actually really enjoy jury duty. I've done it before. I've been on a jury, mm. but I just don't have the time right now. I'm starting school again, too, in March. So come on, universe. Give me a break. Anyway. Ooh, our, all of our phones are going So off. mugs. Here, here's, here's the backstory on the mugs. We started this whole mug thing. We had the whole slew of people right off the bat who were like, I want one. I want one. So we put all these people on the waiting list. And... I get it. You it look came... really hot in that hat. Oh. <laughs> you seriously do. Like, why is okay. he looking at me like that? Go on. <laughs> um, no, I totally lost my train of thought. Sorry. Uh, oh, and so we came back and we finally had the mugs. And we're like, all right, guys, it's, we're ready to go with the mugs. I'm trying to do this through Facebook. And only like seven people followed through with ordering. And for me to start reaching out individually to people and tracking all this in a spreadsheet, it's just like... I just got done talking about how crazy busy I am. So we're going with a new, no more waiting list. Sorry, if you were on a waiting list, 
Hopefully they can't hear that. <laughs> if you are on a waiting list, we're just starting from square one now. So if you want a mug, email us at thestrangesessions.com with your address and what your order is. Yep. So if you want one white mug, and we have one red, one black, but there's more being produced. So whatever your order is, give us your address right away. I will respond and confirm, yes, we have that in stock. And I will give you the links to our Venmo and our PayPal. And as soon as payment comes through, I'll send it. It's yep. just going to be whoever emails me first with the order and we have it in stock. Now, if you ask for something we don't have in stock, I'll let you know that. And I don't want any payment until we have it in stock. I don't want to be trying to remember who's paid me and who hasn't. And if we end up getting more orders for what we have in stock, that's great too. There'll just be a little bit of a turnaround time. It's about 30 days because the coating that goes on the mugs has to cure for 30 yeah. days. But in the meantime, I want to get a online merch store set up so that people can, you know, have a lot more to choose from. T-shirts, hats would be cool, keychains, stuff like that. Yep. So. And I love what Beth painted. I yeah. love, love, that'll love be it. really cool on a t-shirt and even like she a had a t-shirt cool. made and she was she sent me a picture of her wearing really? it oh, yeah that's so cool yeah. i want to see that i'll show you damn it oh i should have sent a text it to you but i forgot i did text you that i was i avoid our reviews like the play oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. i don't like it and then every but once I was in a while sending, you sent me one and i'm like oh yeah because i had to send somebody <laughs> our link to our itunes and a review showed and i was like Ugh. it was like four out of five stars though but it was good yeah and it said it said uh when i first listened to it i didn't care for it but it really grew on me i, and love, now those. I love it and yeah, i, we're think, like I feel like that's how we are we're like a slow burn yeah you mold. Know, we're kind of like mold. We're kind of like mold. <laughs> like not the toxic kind, but just no, like the like kind of mold. the kind of gross kind that you all of a sudden you're like, we it's could like use on this your for cheese. penicillin. We could use this for penicillin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're sort of like a cure. Oh, for... I did that last, not last week, but the week before. You I grew w- some penicillin. No, <laughs> I, I um, bought. You know, like the Carl Budding sliced meat? Yeah. That's like one of my favorite snacks. It's really good, Yeah, and actually. that's like one of my favorite it's snacks. It's so tender and yep. really cheap. Yep, that's one of my favorite snacks. Mm-hmm. So one day after work, I got home, and I, you know, opened a pack and was eating it. And I'm like, something's wrong. And oh, I looked I'm down at horrified. it. I looked down at it, and it was furry and uh, moldy. No, and you But I don't know it. if the part that I ate was. So I just sat on my couch, not knowing if I was going to throw up or poop or Like just or bracing die. yourself for... Yeah. Oh, the aftermath of fuzzy meat. <laughs> <laughs> That's my band name. <laughs> the aftermath of fuzzy meat. Oh my god. The aftermath of fuzzy meat. You're welcome, person out there who's looking for a weird band name. Sweet hats. Jeremy Ritter said sweet hats. <laughs> awesome. Here's a picture of Beth in the shirt. And I think the shirt looks awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. So That's amazing. I love it. We'll reveal what the shirt is. What the what the painting looks like that yeah, you made. Uh, and on a black t shirt. Yes, perfect. <sighs> yes. Anyway, we're probably running late what? in our titillating twenty. Oh, Thirteen minutes. Okay, let's do this taste test stuff. Okay. Let's open this first because this is from Beth. Do I need our ceremonial ni- opening knife? You. It won't hurt. Okay. Well, our <laughs> ceremonial, <laughs> like we're gonna summon a demon opening something. It does look like a demon summoning knife. <laughs> it looks awesome. I hope somebody breaks in here once in like a home invasion thing, just so you can use that to kill someone. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> you better take that back right now, Kurt. Should I just... I take it back. I don't have the latitude for your attitude today, mister. Wow. <laughs> latitude wow, this... for your attitude? Yeah. How do you like that? Just How do you like them the apples? top of my head. Whoa. Oh, this is like riveting for our listeners. Although, part of me thinks people actually do enjoy hearing me struggle with packages, so. It didn't even do anything. No, because the staples <laughs> the staples are lower than where you were cutting. Mm. Come on. I'm afraid to, like, cut through something. Okay. <laughs> oh, here we go. I was trying to rip the wrong part. All right, we got thank a postcard so much for from this. Pittsburgh. Oh, yay. Thank you, Beth. Hey, you want to read it? Hi, Kurt and Krista. I have a friend who lives in Japan. She sent me some coffee to try. The packaging is really cool. You will see. That's all I have to say about the coffee. Kurt, I am purposely including this Pittsburgh postcard. You mentioned on the podcast for all to hear that I live near Philadelphia. That is a nope. I am black and gold. Beth, I am so sorry. I am so sorry I slighted you and said that you live near Philadelphia. They're like little kitty cat stickers. Isn't that cute? Those are cute. All right, here's the coffee. She painted that. 
What? The, the, cat? the cat. Yes. Shut up. Yes. I thought that was a photograph. No, she, she, holy moly, her, she's her really artwork talented. is amazing. Wow. Right. That's amazing. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Wow. Okay. Coffee. I'd read it, but I don't speak Japanese, so it's Japan, right? Is that what yeah. you said? So how are we going to test this? Are we, we testing this? We could test that next time, maybe, okay. because we're going to need to prepare for it. Little single yes. coffee thing. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to so. te- we're going to taste test this next time. Okay, I'm not going to take pictures till then. No. Plus, I'll I'll I won't get two huge cups of coffee like I did today from McDonald's. So thank you. Chris almost decapitated herself on the lights. So thank you so much, Beth, for the, the coffee. We are going to try that next time. I'm excited. So thank you so much, Beth. We're, I'm excited to try this coffee. Okay. This is from Menards. Every once in a while, Menards. If you're not from, I don't know if they have Menards everywhere, if it's a Midwestern thing. but They have some funky chip flavors at Menards. They do. It's where we got the roasted sweet corn yeah. potato chips. Those it tastes really like good. cream corn. But you can buy like flooring and appliances there and also plants. <laughs> and a bit of like gardening stuff, you can groceries, and grills. yeah, yeah. There's so let's groceries get a little there bit of everything. It's pretty. It's like one of my favorite places in the world. But anyway, this is hers: hot cocoa and marshmallow flavored snack, snack balls. balls. <laughs> so wow, I saw that. I and have like, never seen those strange. there. I feel like it's going to be kind of like. Did you take cereal? a picture of the front? Oh no, I didn't. Beth, okay. I am so sorry. I said you are from Philadelphia. Maybe she's still friends with you. Yes. So thank you. She's from Pittsburgh. Sure Corey loves Pittsburgh. Corey's a huge Pittsburgh Penguins fan. Oh, really? Yep. I wasn't there. I was in Philadelphia. Reminds me of a Gilmore Girls episode when Richard would rather be in Philadelphia. If you're a Gilmore's girl fan, you know. I liked Philadelphia. You? No. <laughs> wow. She just roasted me. Does it smell good? Smell it. Smell it. <laughs> you should have seen her eyes get She's wide when so she excited. smelled it. It smells like like cocoa puffs. Like hot, it yeah, kind of like does. It smells puffs. like hot chocolate, though. I feel like what they did here was take actual hot powdered hot chocolate and like toss this stuff in it. Okay, I'm gonna. I was watching some. I don't remember if it was on YouTube or it was on Instagram or it was on TikTok, because oh. my students have me on TikTok now. But somebody made macaroni and cheese and hot chocolate. And they put the together? no, but they put the cocoa seasoning in the macaroni, and they put the cheese powder in the hot water, and ate it like that. No, no. Krista shaking her head. No. I'm gonna put two balls in my mouth at once. I'm gonna leave that alone. I'm trying to get a semi blurry photo of it. Maybe these are like big footballs. Okay, ready? I'm ready. Oh. Mmm. Mmm. They taste like cereal. Like. I would totally eat this with a bowl of it's milk. Got, it has like the cheese puff aftertaste, mm-hmm. though. It's. I think it's the same kind of carrier as a cheese puff, but instead of cheese, they put hot cocoa on it. <laughs> that is not bad. No. I got a whole pile here. Seriously, you could eat this like cereal. <laughs> Drop one. Mm. This would be awesome with milk on it. Like mm-hmm. It would be like big, mm-hmm. thick Actually, the milk cocoa puffs. would be... Really good to drink mm-hmm. afterwards, too. It'd be basically chocolate milk. You need to try it. Mm. Yeah, you can take those home. You can have them. Are you sure? Yeah. I figure like you guys would like them. Sorry, we won't eat, eat for like 10 minutes. Okay, I'm going to put them over here. Oh, my gosh. Mm. Those are really good. What are you going to give it out of 10? I mean, as far as like really terrible for you snack food, like over-processed food goes, they're pretty damn good. I'm giving it a 10. Wow. Yep. I'm going to give it an 8. I love chocolate. <laughs> there's some there's something off-putting about the hmm. the like there's the cheese puff taste in there. I know what you're saying. But like you said, it's the actual ball and mm. it's not the seasoning, but mm. the ball flavor <laughs> tastes just like I just annoyed myself. Tastes like a <clears throat> hot cocoa. But no. like it does sort of taste like cocoa puffs. But it's got that it's got that it has that cheese ball taste. Mm-hmm. A little bit. I bet you that would be good with milk. You got to try be. it. You have to try it with milk. Mm-hmm. Okay. I had one more thing I wanted to mention. We are at 20 minutes, but real quick, there's a new movie out on Netflix called The Dig. I don't know if anyone has run across this yet, but I'm bringing this up because it's, um, I guess it's, they called it a reimagining of the book by the same name and it's the about the 1939 excavation of Sutton Hoo burial mounds which we mentioned in our listener submission mm-hmm. episode 
which is near Woodbridge, which is near Rendlesham Forest, which we've also done an episode on. So if anyone has watched the movie yet, feel free to share that with us on the Strangers page or Instagram. But I plan to watch it before we record again, and maybe I'll give a little review of it. But I just think it's cool to see a movie come out about a topic that we've covered on yeah. the show. I feel like we're out of time for tarot, so if we have time at the end, we'll do yeah, it. Yeah, we'll do tarot at the end. Yeah. Um, I'm still doing it like every day, but we're I fizzling out on, on the show. I finished the first maybe season of Hellier, so oh, now I'm kind of so back good. with synchronicity, so now I kind of yes. want to do Randa nodding again. Mm. I'm well, telling you, season two is even better. Randa nodding, now they did a thing with the app where you get 30 free things a day, but you can buy owl tokens to get more times you can... I want an owl token. But no, it's like virtual owl tokens, so you can do it more. But one thing they added, I did pay $2 for that it won't put me in water anymore because it used to put me in the middle of Lake Michigan. <laughs> nice. So I want to get... Well, that's bet. good. That's I like the first idea. season of Hellier. I've heard mixed reviews on the second. Some said it got a little corny with it. everything's a synchronicity. Like, oh my God, I just walked up these steps that I just walked down. It's a synchronicity. Mm. Like that. You mm. know, like it's. I loved season two. I did. I felt like season one took a while for, for it to get going and for me to really get into it. Like all the stuff when they visit the town, they're trying to talk to townspeople. That was kind of eh for me. What always still throws me off is hearing F-bombs or people mm. swear on those shows because I'm so yeah. used to not hearing people mm -hmm. like swear on shows like that. So I feel like that always throws me off. I really like season two, but it's also probably the because I was sucked in. The stuff with the tin can in. was kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm iffy Did on the whole. Did they make a molehill yeah, out of a mountain? Yeah, I'm iffy on the molehill out of a mountain. Mountain out of a molehill. Molehill, hill. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. I love that technique that they're using, though. I think that would be really fun to try. I don't remember what they call it. Yep. But I think that I've seen on Kindred Spirits yeah, it, occasionally not, when I watch that they I'm do that too. Not a Frank's Box fan with the radio where they have the but but I do if the like person it. can't hear. I like the Ovulus too. I just think it's really interesting and it's something I've never used and I'd love to try. I get that. Do you want to go first with your story? You always make me go first. I can't. Well, you're, you're like the appetite. You're like the uh, the crudite. What's the thing called? They put out that wooden plate with slices of cheese and meat. The cooter plate. No, it's, in a, it's a cooter. Crudite. Is that what that is? Or um, not a cooter plate. Accoutrement. No, isn't no, I, it? Uh, I talked about it in the last episode. I used. It's. Uh, I want, not cooter plate. No, I want to say that's definitely not. I want to say it's, it's like chamomile charcuterie board. Yes, there we that's go. what it is. Not cooter plate. I'll take some cheese. Don't order a crackers. cooter plate online from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I actually am going to put glasses on. Why? Because I'm getting old. Yeah, because you probably were drinking that tea, that ayahuasca or whatever that ayahuasca. tea. Is. Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. When I they gave me my I probably wouldn't need glasses. When they gave me my go. coffee at McDonald's this morning, it smelled so much like weed. Like, really? Yeah, like yuck. Why would your coffee smell like I don't weed? know. That's weird. Hmm. That's a good look. Okay. <clears throat> Are you ready? I was born ready, baby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh all right. So my mini mystery and I'll I'll reveal where the this story idea came from at the end, but it's about Dudley Town, Connecticut. Are you ready to learn about Dudley Town? I am 100% on board with this. <sighs> okay. According to Wikipedia, Dudley Town is, is an abandoned settlement in northwestern Connecticut, which has gotten a bit of a reputation of being a ghost town. However, it was never actually a town. It's just a portion of Cornwall that at some point was dubbed Dudley Town due to the extended Dudley family that eventually settled there in the mid to late 1700s. It was converted from forest to farmland, which apparently most of Corn that's the deal with most of Cornwall. Um, and the majority of the population that lived there made their income through farming. So I'm going to be referencing bits and pieces from an article on the Hartford Current website called, quote, a village of curses, question mark. And then some tidbits from Wikipedia and also, of course, a couple of Reddit posts because you can't research anything without, you know, going to Reddit. <laughs> So I'm going to start with all the sort of alleged paranormal happenings that have occurred in Dudley Town. And I kept calling it Dudleyville in my head. I'm like, is it Dudleyville or Dudley Town? It's Dudley Town. Okay. The Hartford Current article states, quote, besides an allegedly cursed founding family, we'll get to that, Dudley Town is linked to stories about Native Americans invading the village and killing an entire family. Oh, you know, because we've slaughtered like their entire populations over the course exactly. of how many years. Exactly. There's a one story about them killing a family <laughs> yeah. and it's like, whoa. 
Uh, lightning fatally striking the wife of Revolutionary War General Herman Swift on her doorstep, which in turn caused him to go mad. Wow. Various epidemics, which eh, epidemics happened back in the 17 and 1800s. They're still happening now, obviously. Yes, they are. Mm. And finally, in 1872, the wife of New York Tribune editor Horace Greeley committing suicide. Horace. Horace, Horace. Yeah. Committing suicide there. We'll get to that too. Wow, I'm getting Krista left and right here. She, I'm, I, I, I'm I don't at like least hand po- I don't at least point my finger at you when I say <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> By 1880, all but one man, John Brophy, had abandoned the place, and he, even he was said to occasionally be seen walking out of the woods with torn clothes, muttering things about demons. Who hasn't done that? Well, duh. That's like a Tuesday night for me. All right. I found a lengthy post by Reddit user, (laughs) The Odd Senses, that's their name, about some additional strange things rumored to have happened in Dudleyville. I called it Dudleyville. (laughs) Type Dudleyville. This is why Krista should not be in charge of doing stories. (laughs) It was like two days ago that I finally decided what I was doing. All right. Is there a steak burrito recipe mixed in with the thing? No, no. Thank God. Although, you know, that's like a twofer. All right. <laughs> Dudley Town, in regards to the alleged curse that weren't noted in the Hartford Current article and also a retelling of an experience his friend had there. I actually have no idea if this person, the odd senses, is a man or woman. I just have this like weird feeling it's a man. So I refer to him as he. Sorry if you're a woman and you're not listening, so it doesn't matter. All right. Quote. Citizens of the village, and just bear with me, it's really painful to read Reddit posts sometimes because the the grammatical errors and the spelling is just like insane. So sometimes I end up editing their posts because I can't handle reading what's actually written. Um, Okay, citizens of the village started to experience bizarre happenings. Some people had reported very strange creatures lurking in the surrounding forest, but of course there's no descriptions included. Some of the workers cutting down timber had reported seeing sickly animals lurking in the forest. They had reported seeing bizarre creatures they'd never witnessed before walking around the outside of town. Some villagers had even reported seeing a demon-like creature skulking around town. What does a demon-like creature look like? Like I'm picturing a dude with horns. I don't know. I don't know. What does a demon look like? Like a dude with horns. Yeah, like a like a... A dude with like goat legs, <laughs> or like the the picture Dash drew, like the green guy. Yeah, that looks like an alien to me. I think extraterrestrial when I see that. Really? I don't think demon. I think demon. Really? Well, it was your monster. <laughs> That's right. It's it was your my monster. monster don't card. talk about my monster like that. <laughs> um. Okay, demon-like creature skulking around town. After the reports began to circulate, strange occurrences began to arise. Townsfolk had begun to die often. <laughs> Some due to accidents while working, probably, you know, just have you heard about how dangerous it is to be like a a lumber person? What are they called? Lumberjack. There you go. Some in ways that couldn't quite be explained. Of course, there's no details. People also started reporting family members and friends acting strange. Shortly after, reports of demonic possession began to circulate through the town. After a while, people began to leave town and find shelter elsewhere. Eventually, the town was completely empty. The houses were torn down, any remaining useful lumber was cleared out, and all that remained was some old cellars and foundations of old homes. Which is true. I've heard that that's really all that's left. Then he kind of goes on to talk about, like, how it's kind of hard to get in there because it's actually private property now. But he says later in his post, quote, I went there with some friends back in high school, 2006, maybe 2007. While we did not personally have any experiences that night, we did notice that the town has a bizarre silence to it. He loves the word bizarre. Just going to say that right <laughs> so now. There's going to be lots of bizarre. Oh, yeah. No crickets, no birds, no bats, nothing, which for Connecticut, a Connecticut forest is extremely bizarre. Our forests are lush with living creatures, and for there to be any silence is unheard of. The town absolutely has an extremely bizarre negative energy to it. You'll also catch a strange wind come through town. You won't hear any leaves rustle from it. You won't even hear the wind itself. But it will be a frigid wind, even in the middle of summer. And when it does make a sound, it can very easily sound like whispering, which may be explained by the mountains. This place sounds really interesting, actually. Yeah, it kind of does. The town is apparently situated in the middle of three mountains, or possibly something else. Now, as I said, when I went there, I didn't experience it much. It was absolutely creepy, and the energy is off, but nothing much besides that. However, our friend Jason had brought us down there. He's actually camped out overnight in town, and he's a veteran of exploring Dudley Town. 
On the hike in, he had told us a few stories of his experiences over the years. Now, as they are stories from a third party, I cannot corroborate any of the stories, but I would tend to believe Jason, possibly with slight exaggeration. It's kind of a contradiction. One of the stories... I'm really snarky today. I feel like we're both weird today. Like, we're both extra silly (laughs) or we're both extra snarky. I was just thinking that. Like, we're not off today, but we're weird today. We're on. We're silly today. Yeah, we're silly. (laughs) One of the stories he had told us was about the first and last time he camped out overnight. He and two of his friends had set up a tent in the foundation of an old house. While they were lying in the tent getting ready to sleep, they had all heard what sounded like someone wearing boots walking across a wooden floor. It only lasted for a couple of seconds, but it had freaked everyone out enough that they weren't able to fall asleep. He had explained that at this point they were all very exhausted, although couldn't sleep. So perhaps the exhaustion played a part in their experiences, but the fact that everyone experienced the same events makes it hard to blame the exhaustion. After the footsteps, everyone sat up in the tent and began to talk about what they had heard and were all a bit shocked. Jason had decided to light up a cigarette a minute or so after the footsteps. However, it refused to stay lit. He would light it, take a puff, and then it would go out seconds later. He had begun to get frustrated with it and threw the cigarette out of the tent. It's literary. He checked his watch and decided that maybe it was a good idea to try to sleep again. When he checked his watch, it was about 1.33 a.m. and they had to be up by 5 a.m. They needed to pack up and leave before sunrise in case any police came through to patrol. Everyone talked for a minute and tried to fall asleep again. They all laid down and tried to sleep. <laughs> Everyone had tossed and turned and none of them were able to stay comfortable. They all had complained about the sensation that their skin was crawling. They had all experienced sudden hot flashes, and all night they'd felt as though someone was watching them. Jason had finally sat up and decided he just wasn't going to be able to sleep. He pulled out his phone to text his girlfriend and noticed that it had said 1.35 a.m. They were only laying there for two minutes. Wow. (laughs) They were all far beyond confused. They felt as though they'd been tossing and turning in their sleeping bags for at least a half hour, but it had only been a couple of minutes. For the next hour or so, they sat in their tent smoking cigarettes and having random conversations. However, their camping trip was turned upside down when at around 3.20 a.m. they heard a loud crunching of leaves coming from the forest next to them. The footsteps had come out of nowhere. They didn't hear the footsteps start further away and come closer. They just seemed to start out of nowhere at the most 30 or 40 feet from the tent. They had thought maybe it was a bear or a deer, but the footsteps were abnormal. Jason had described it to me as though someone would like take two quick steps and then stop for a second or two and then take another two steps, stop for a second or two, and then take another two more quick steps. Also, squirrels kind of do this. Yeah. I mean, this is what they do. Yeah. So, And they're really loud. Squirrels are tiny, but they make so much noise. Deer make like zero noise in the forest, actually. Almost as though someone was leaping from one point to another. Everyone in the tent began to panic. Everyone had a weapon of some kind in their hand and sat there frozen while the footsteps circled the trees outside of the tent. I'm going with squirrel. The footsteps stopped after a minute, but they didn't seem to walk away from the tent. Yeah, they went up the tree. Yep. <laughs> We have a just, lot of squirrels. Just like in our the one yard. we were looking at before we started and Lucy recording. Was, and Lucy, I thought she was going to die if she Lucy couldn't get to it. wanted that squirrel. Oh my God. Well, it was eating her bird food, you know. <laughs> they began to panic that maybe someone was outside watching them from the trees. Jason's friend had yelled out something like, Is somebody out there? To which there was no response. After a few minutes, they decided they should check. Jason grabbed a flashlight and so did the others. They slowly opened the tent, shining as much light outside as they could. They pointed their flashlights towards where the sounds were coming from, but nothing was there. They kept the lights on the trees for a while when they heard a very deep, very guttural, very raspy growl from the trees behind them. Okay, that's probably not a squirrel. <laughs> they spun around. <laughs> They're not known for their raspy growls. <laughs> squirrel on uh, steroids, maybe. <laughs> They spun around, flashed the lights, and behind them was a rather open section of the town. The nearest tree line was about 100 feet away, and they saw nothing in the openness. At that point, they decided it was time to leave. They grabbed their valuables, but actually left the tent, as they were too freaked out to bother packing up a tent they spent $40 on Walmart the day before they went to the town. Jason had told us that the hike back was nerve-wracking. The entire 10-minute hike out of town felt as though they were being watched, and something was trying to push them out of town. Once they had gotten out of Dudley Town limits, once they had gotten out of Dudley Town limits, their anxiety and hot flashes, cold sweats, and feelings of being watched melted away. 
I skipped through the rest of the post and then noticed something that jumped out at me. The very last sentence of the Reddit user's post says, quote, the Warren family investigated Dudley Town in the 1970s, and Lorraine verified that there is absolutely multiple demonic presence in the town. So I Googled that to see if I could substantiate that in Nothing. any way. Several articles said like the same sentence just worded differently yeah. with nothing else. And I found another article that said that while Ed and Lorraine did visit the site in the 70s, they were unable to find any definitive evidence <laughs> of paranormal or demonic activity. So I guess the jury is still out yep. on that. So another Reddit user, screen name, I don't even know how to say this, Sabunpmaka. Sounds good to me. <laughs> sure. Responded to this original post with a story of their own, which had some really strange elements to it. So that last, the creepiest thing about that last story was the loss of time. Yeah. Or not even loss of time, actually. It was that they thought compressed, they had been laying. Yeah, yeah something. Like compressed time or something really like bizarre. that. It's really bizarre. Anything that messes with time freaks me out a yep. little bit. Yep. So she, the, and I'm saying she, again, I just get a feeling it's a female, so I go with that. They don't say anything that actually you know leads gives any kind of indication um so i refer to her as she but she had responded earlier saying that she had some experiences she didn't want to go into there because she wanted to protect the identity of the people she was with and then people were like oh you can't do that you got to tell us so then she she wrote this short little blurb and she just uses a letter for the people that she that was with her although how would we know who like matthew or david was you know exactly anyway So she says, I'll give you the one that is the reason I tell people not to go alone. A small group of us, four, myself, D, M, and S, went deep into the woods there. At first it was normal, then sounds became muted, and we started the process of looking for whatever was, quote, haunting the woods. Spoiler alert, it is not by a strict definition of haunting. We came to the conclusion that was likely just, for lack of a better word, nature spirits. That is, things that were never incarnate. It's a thing. I mean, that kind totally. of pops up in the missing 411 yeah, stories. Like as a fairies possibility. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Fairies, uh, fae folk. Yeah. yeah, totally. Well, as we're walking, two of us, Em and I, see an old bridge leading over a shallow ravine. Probably an old river, but it could have been anything in the dark. So we start heading there. When S and D pull us back, there was no bridge. We were about to walk off the ravine and take a bit of a fall. Weird. Yeah. Again, shallow, not too far, but broken bones were highly probable. Okay, well, maybe we saw something that, quote, looked like a bridge in our lights. Possible, right? There are a few more cases of this type of hallucination between all four of us, so we decided that, no, it's not just that we saw something that wasn't there, and that maybe, just maybe, we might want to leave. So we start walking out. The four of us are all having a conversation, following our path out. I I feel bad reading this. She says, I am a fat ass. (laughs) I just, like, I feel so bad even saying that out loud. But I guess it lends to the story, and it says in quote or er, in parentheses, it is amazing how fat one can remain while hiking daily. So I usually bring up the rear. Today was no exception. When by chance, I look off to the left. S is about 20 meters, possibly more, as we did have to shout to him, off the path, turning back into the woods, carrying on a conversation by himself. Keep in mind, not two seconds earlier, I saw him in front of me. We were talking to him. He was in our group walking with us, except he wasn't. According to him, he was following the group and chatting with us. No, we weren't on drugs. (laughs) That's really creepy. Yeah, that is. Something in those woods was able to make us see things that weren't there. Now, I don't recall the details of what each of us saw, and my old journals from back then are God knows where, but that incident is one that is really potent because there's nothing spectacular about it, and yet it was the most dangerous trip we'd had there. We did see other stuff, floating orbs of light with what looked like tiny human in them. Well, that's spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> uh, stranger stuff, too. Stranger than that? <laughs> like, that's not like, oh, okay. I see that all the time when I'm I on mean, my we bikes. see, like, floating orbs of people in them, but <laughs> not a big deal. You are snarky today. <laughs> uh, but that one was the most, quote, dangerous one. It was also one of the smallest groups I'd gone in with. Note, we'd gone in a number of times and had absolutely nothing happen as well. It seems to be seasonal. No idea why, if I recall correctly. And it has now been 20 years, so I could be off. It was early autumn, perhaps September, October. So if you go mid-July and nothing happens, well, that wouldn't be too surprising. Of course, I could remember the season wrong, and it could have been summer, but I get the sense it was spring-autumn due to being able to see how far S had traveled away from the path out. So that's creepy. That's too, you know, 
stories about people who went in there and definitely experienced something odd. Not just like hearing things in the woods, but weird stuff that messes with like your quote unquote reality. That's creepy to me. Yeah, it is. But if you go in there already on edge, yes. thinking you're going to see your stuff. Your perception might yeah. be a little off, yeah. whatever. But it sounds like a place I would like to really check out. Now, about this curse. Oh boy. According to Wikipedia, a local rumor has been frequently shared on the internet that alleges the founders of Dudley Town were descended from Edmund Dudley, an English nobleman who was beheaded for treason during the reign of Henry VIII. From that moment on, the Dudley family was allegedly placed under a curse which followed them across the Atlantic to America. Dang it. This <laughs> curse is blamed for instances of crop failures and mental illness in the village. But local historians have found no genealogical link between the Dudley family of Cornwall and the English nobleman. So while the legend claims that the curse is to blame for crop failures, the village's decline was instead attributed to its distance from clean drinking water and soil that is not well suited for cultivation. I also saw in the article from the Hartford Current that this portion of Cornwall was located on a high hill, which apparently is also not ideal for farmland. Another article talked about how being situated in the middle of mountains, even though it's apparently on a high hill, I'm trying to like picture the topography here, makes for poor sunlight, which would be detrimental to growing crops as well. Very true. And about that suicide. Oh boy. According to Wikipedia, one confirmed case of suicide of a village resident actually took place in New York State rather than in Cornwall. Oh. If you're in the area and you want to check it out... It's private property, and it's not open to the public. Police, it apparently had they been probably for some have, time. They probably have problems with trespassers. Oh, I'm yeah. Police guess. do apparently patrol the area because of all the trespassing yep. <laughs> and vandalism. <laughs> yep. Apparently, you can hike in from a certain location. There's a forest called Dark Entry, which seems appropriate. <laughs> I don't know if I want to yeah, hike in Yeah, I'm not sure I want to enter entry. that Dark Entry. And if you go in that way, you are less likely to be seen by police, so enter at your own risk, kids. Exactly. Fun fact, Dudley Town is located about five and a half hours from Burkittsville, Maryland. Ooh, I know where that, that Blair Witch Project. Yep, the town that the Blair Witch Project was centered around, although the film actually wasn't even shot in Burkittsville. Yeah. It was filmed in the Seneca Creek State Park, which is 25 miles away. Anyway, after that movie came out, it spawned a renewed interest in Dudley Town, and people just went flocking there to experience like have a Blair Witch experience yeah. and that contributed to the trespassing the vandalism yes, etc which makes sense so I don't know it all se it seems like all the legends that allegedly make Dudley Town haunted either can't be substantiated or downright false but it sounds like people have experience but people there. have experiences there exactly but I'm calling it a Dudleyville a little bit of a dud just because none <laughs> of the history seems to be true yeah. yep. but I find yeah, that but it, the it could experiences be one, are interesting yeah like maybe situate like experiences happened and people built a legend up around those experiences mm -hmm. so just because you can't substantiate the rumors of, or legends about the place doesn't mean that it's not active. Right. I feel a little bad saying that it's a dud because the story was suggested by a beloved stranger, Jody. I'm going to butcher your last name. Bestart? Best. <laughs> I can't say your last name. Jody B. Thank you, Jody, for saving my butt because just a few days ago I had no idea what I was going to cover and then I go and poo-poo all over uh. <laughs> the story she gave me. But I do think... I don't think you poo-pooed over it. I just think the interesting stuff is the experiences. Is the experiences yeah. and not so much the legends. So I, I don't right. think that's a that's a poo-pooing. So what do you think of Dudley Town, Kurt? Should we road trip to Connecticut? Yeah. Think? I think it sounds interesting. Like if that stuff really happened... Mm -hmm. We should probably try not to get arrested though. I'm just saying. No. But I would love to experience some of the stuff that they experienced. Although then we could substantiate whether or not um, they call it TSS in the jail yards. <laughs> yeah, we could if we're in prison. <laughs> oh, good time. I'll have some cred because, you know, TSS. TSS, yo. They'd be like, don't mess with that guy. He's from TSS. Right? I'm gonna post they have like, it. you know, a thousand people who listen. Mm -hmm. I think that number's creeping up actually. Like regular listeners. That's exciting. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. I was born ready. Yeah. <laughs> No platitude for well, my you, you attitude me, today. You made me snort. I thought that was an interesting story. I really did. Like, I didn't know anything about that. No, I'd never even heard so, of it. So I love the experiences. Like, mm -hmm. legends are always eh. disappointing when you they just actually are. start to research them. You're actually, yeah, but you're cool. absolutely correct on that. Very cool. And now it's time for my story, Coral Castle. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Let's that's, have a that's chat. From, that's from Good Mythical Morning. Oh, okay. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about it. Don't sue me, Link and Red, because I really like your podcast. <laughs> That's how they open their episode. Are they listening, Kurt? 
I'd like to think so. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll go with it. The story of Coral Castle begins with a mysterious man named Edward Ed. I don't know why they have that in there. Is, is Ed a nickname? Yeah. But if you're Edward, you're automatically an Ed. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You're not a ward. Yeah. <laughs> so a mysterious <laughs> man named Edward Ed Lee Scallon. That's a killer last name. What is it? Leesk Alnin. L E E S K A L N I N. Wow. Leesk Alnin. Okay. I'm going to probably stumble over that a hundred times, so I'm just going to call him Ed. Ed Lee. I'm just going to say Ed. Ed, yeah. Yep. There are so many conflicting reports about him that nobody is exactly sure what his real story is, but here's a story that most people believe to be true. Ed was born in Latvia in 1887. Ed's parents were farmers in the Latvian feudal system, and he managed to send Ed to school through the fourth grade. After that, he helped with the fields and also became a stonemason. That's important, that he mm-hmm. became a stonemason. Okay. When he was 26 years old, he met a girl 10 years younger than him named Agnes Scruffs, and he fell in love with her. Ed constantly referred to her as his sweet 16. That's cute. Yeah, yeah I, get, I get in trouble when I refer to people <laughs> as my sweet 16, but it's cool for him. <laughs> The two were to be married, but on the day before the wedding, Agnes called it off because her and her mother felt that Ed was too old and too poor. Heartbroken, Ed came to America, where he hoped to become successful and vowed that one day he would send a vengeful letter to Agnes and her mother showing how wrong they had been about him. Yeah, exactly. And I get it. You know. I'd like to, what is the actual age difference? 10 years. Oh. He's 26. Then that wasn't a big deal. No, he's 26 and she's 16. I mean, that sounds creepy as all get out right yeah. now, but back then, yeah. that really wasn't that big of a deal, I don't well, think. Well, a 10-year age difference still isn't... When you're a teenager well, and yeah. in their 20s, it yeah. is... A d- but like when I was dating Natalie, we were 10 years yeah. apart. When you get when to you're be older, older I, yeah. it makes no difference. Yeah, I agree. but when you're 26 and the girl's 16, it That's can be... illegal. <laughs> it, it can be iffy. It can be an and iffy illegal. situation. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Coming to America and landing in New York in 1912... Ed made his way across the country by working various jobs such as a ranch hand, a logger, or a mason. It's also said that he contracted tuberculosis along the way but managed to cure it on his own, telling people he cured himself using magnetism. He made his way across the country to Oregon, and people always say I say that wrong. I I say Oregon, and I think it's Oregon. I say Oregon. I think it's Oregon. Like a organ? Yeah. (laughs) Or an organ? I say Oregon. I say Oregon, too. We're Midwesterners. He made his way across the country to Oregon, but wanting to live someplace warmer, he eventually made his way to southern Florida, where he purchased a small parcel of land for $12 and began the next phase of his plan, which would eventually become known as Coral Castle. Hmm. Still in love with Agnes and heartbroken, he wanted to construct something as a testament to his love for her and to show her that he wasn't just some schmuck. Hmm. (laughs) Here's where the mystery comes in. Over the next 20 years, the 5-foot-tall, 100-pound man single-handedly quarried, moved, and carved over 2.2 million pounds, or 1,100 tons, of limestone, working almost only at night. Uh, Okay, I have heard this story. How long did it take him? 20 years. Oh, dang. Originally, he called what he was building Ed's Place, but then he changed it to Rockgate Park. People would come to watch him work on it, but he wanted privacy, so in 1936, he bought a different parcel of land 10 miles away in Homestead, Florida, and Ed spent the next three years moving everything to the new area using a friend's tractor and a homemade trailer. The friend was only allowed to show up at a certain time in the morning, and when he arrived, tons of limestone were already loaded up onto his truck. And this was just Ed by himself. Wow. Five foot tall, 100 pound yep. Ed. He continued working on his spectacle, and after all the carvings were in place in 1940, Ed finished erecting the walls. Each section of wall is 8 feet tall, 4 feet wide, and 3 feet thick. When all was said and done, Ed had used 2.2 million pounds of limestone to construct his creation, now known as Rockgate. 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 Okay. According to an article on the website The Bitter Southerner called, quote, A Haunting Monument to Love, or Aliens, or Limestone, The article says, quote, When Ed's place was completed in 1951, he offered tours, revealing to visitors what had become a kind of simulacrum of a home built in Agnes's honor, should his love ever return to him. There was a throne, a heart-shaped table, a bathtub, and what Ed called his mad rocker, a side-by-side rocking chair so that the lovers could face away from each other but still be close during an argument. (laughs) (laughs) Which I think is... Really thought everything out. I think it's cute. 
I like the man. He's about. anticipating them having a bumpy <laughs> they marriage. Fights and like not wanting to look at each other, but still wanting to sit by each other. <laughs> I think that's so cute. I don't know. That's Maybe really that's funny. just me. Admission was 10 cents, and he'd wax poetic about the unseen girl, her youth, and his subsequent humiliation. Celestial objects and others appeared in threes, three moons, three planets, three chairs, as if to imply his love was beyond this earthly plane or to send the rest of us generations later desperately searching for meaning. The construction consists of all these towers, beds, tables, rocking chairs, sundials, and bizarre astrological figures. The place is really cool. Hmm. It really is. According to Wikipedia, quote, at Florida City, Ed charged visitors 10 cents apiece to tour the castle grounds, but after moving to Homestead, he asked for donations of 25 cents, but let visitors enter for free if they had no money. Hmm. There are signs carved into rocks at the front gate to, quote, ring bell twice. He would come down from his living quarters in the second story of the castle tower close to the gate and conduct the tour. He never told anyone who asked him how he made the castle. He would simply answer, quote, it's not difficult if you know how. In December of 1951, Ed became sick. He closed the castle and placed a sign on the entrance that read, going to the hospital. Three days later, he died in his sleep from a kidney infection in a Miami hospital. Hmm. After his death, a box was found in the castle with $3,500 in it, which was the money he had made from giving tours of the castle and its admission fee. How much? $3,500. After he died, the property changed hands a few times, and its name was changed to Coral Castle. To this day, there is a lot of speculation about how the heck Ed managed to do all of this by himself only at night. The tallest stone there is 25 feet, and the heaviest stone is 30 tons. When the Category 5 Hurricane Andrew hit Florida in 1992, not a single stone shifted. Interesting. So how the heck did this 5 foot nothing, 100 pound soaking wet guy manage to do all of this by himself? Even with like farming equipment yeah this would be really yeah. hard i gotta grab a blanket i'm freezing okay and as usual there are two basic theories okay theory number one paranormal slash unknown slash otherworldly means again this was a moderately small man who did all of this by himself and worked almost entirely after the sun went down so that people couldn't watch him according to that article on the bitter southerner quote Ed did become famous. There are enough accounts of the construction of Ed's place to know that people were watching. Some say it was clandestine. Others say that it was public. One man, Earl S. Lee, says that he saw Ed, quote, use a small telephone pole to pry rocks out of a ditch. McClure adds that Ed used, quote, tools from old car parts taken from a nearby junkyard to piece together his structures, a fact mentioned on tours at Coral Castle, and that he had a block and tackle and smaller pulleys and hoists. The pine tripod he had could definitely lift 10-ton rocks, but no larger than that. Many people doubt that his 10-ton hoist was capable of lifting the tallest and heaviest pieces of coral that he quarried and then moving and placing those pieces so precisely. I mean, they were they were placed so amazingly precisely. I feel like we still don't know how the <laughs> Egyptians yeah. built the pyramids, yeah. so we're not going to figure out how Ed built his coral castle. In an episode of In Search Of, hosted by Leonard Nimoy, a modern construction crew tried to slice a coral rock slab with a modern diamond-tipped power saw and lift it with a 600-horsepower crane. The process was unwieldy even for them, and Ed mm. didn't have a crane or anything right. like that. According to Wikipedia, quote, the stones are fastened together without mortar. They are set on top of each other using their weight to keep them together. The craftsmanship detail is so fine and the stones are connected with such precision that no light passes through the joints. Hmm. The eight foot tall vertical stones that make up the perimeter wall have a uniform height. Even with the passage of passage, even with the passage of decades and hurricanes, the stones have not shifted. The story he mostly told was the one about his true love dumping him the day before his wedding, but it's said that he also told a story about how he was building a temple dedicated to the Egyptian gods, and he was using the same secret techniques that the ancient Egyptians used to build the pyramids. Mm. 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 Krista's Christ, mm -hmm. pretty cocksure right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ed claimed that he had learned the secrets of the architects of King Solomon's temples by studying books about the pyramids at the local public library. There is a 30-ton telescope. It's not so much a telescope. It's more like a tower that stands 25 feet above the castle walls. 
It has an opening towards the top. It looks like a tower with a big opening towards the top. It's aligned perfectly to the North Star, and on the first day of winter, sunlight streams directly through the opening. There's a crafted sundial that is accurate within two minutes. Hmm. And the gate. There's the gate. The gate is really, really cool. According to an October 8th, 2018 article on Medium.com called, quote, Six Mysteries of Coral Castle, America's Stonehenge, the article says, quote, The biggest mystery of all is the nine-ton rock gate, which is oddly shaped coral that is set so perfectly on a rod that you could push it with a single finger and it would rotate. In fact, Ed referred to his castle as Rock Gate because of this rock. When the door stopped working in the 1980s, a team from the University of Florida went out to see if they could fix it, and they were confounded that Ed could have figured out the exact center of gravity and lifted to place this stone, along with a rod through a perfectly drilled hole, so perfectly. They would need lasers and cranes to accomplish this, and Ed didn't even have electricity. That's crazy. So the fact that, that he was able to make this gate that would... that was nine tons but you could push it with your pinky and open and swing it around is just fascinating i mean the fact that it took him 20 years to do this yes. does i mean we can see that it, he could have really yeah. taken his time and been very meticulous yes. about this yep. but still it yep. seems impossible yeah yeah when that gate was repaired it took a six-man crew with a 20 ton crane to move the large stone slab but even with the six men and the crane they still weren't able to set the gate with the same precision as ed did according to a 2003 article in wired magazine called quote secret energy haunts coral castle the article says quote i just double quoted myself <laughs> <laughs> is that a new thing i think so <laughs> double quoting coral castle guide ray ramirez spent the last two decades trying to figure out just how ed managed to pull off this engineering feat ramirez is a skilled dowser that is someone who uses wooden and metal rods and pendulums to locate sources of water oil or lost objects or ghosts and or ghosts <laughs> and he has his own ideas about how ed managed to move the huge blocks dowsers can also detect unusual energy flows explained ramirez Using metal dowsing rods made of bent coat hangers and PVC tubing, Ramirez says he has located some very odd energy vortexes within the boundaries of the castle. I believe Ed discovered a way to move massive blocks of coral by taking advantage of the magnetic powers of the earth, said Ramirez. The earth is surrounded by an invisible web of energy that is concentrated at certain spots. At these spots, energy flows freely and people are much stronger than they would be elsewhere. Hmm. Ramirez also says that he feels strangely energized when he's in the castle. There are persistent rumors that some curious children snuck in one night to see what he was doing, and they said that they saw Ed moving multi-ton blocks of stone through the air like they were floating or attached to hydrogen balloons. And there are photos online of the large triangular tripod device that Ed used to move rocks. And I'll, I'll post this in the group. There's a... It's, it looks like a tripod, like a big wooden tripod, but there's this box at the top. And there's a lot of discussion about that box, but we'll get to that. Just curted myself. Mm -hmm. Also from the Medium article, Ed was rumored to have lots of knowledge of magnets and how they worked. He even wrote a little booklet called Magnetic Current. In the booklet, he says, quote, because the magnet can be shifted and concentrated, you can see that the metal is not the real magnet. The real magnet is the substance that is circulating inside the metal. Each particle in the substance is an individual magnet by itself and contains both north and south pole individual magnets. They are so small that they can pass through anything. In fact, they can pass through metal easier than through the air. They are in constant motion. Running one kind of magnet against the other kind, and if guided in the right channels, they possess perpetual power. Hmm. He supposedly applied for a patent for a magnetic motor that he claimed would work forever, i.e. it's a perpetual motion machine which is like one of the holy grails. Uh -huh. Like if somebody can make a perpetual motion machine. I, I watched a documentary on this and they touched on that too. Yeah. He had a magnetic flywheel located at the castle that is still there. And I want to say that uh, stranger Josh Carpenter sent me a ton of pictures. He was there. <gasps> he went there oh, so cool. on the same trip. He went there in the Georgia Guidestones. Oh, come on. I know. That's what I said. But he sent me just like a ton of pictures from there. And this is a picture of the perpetual motion machine. I'll post some of these in the strangers after when we do this episode. It looks ancient. Yeah. Yep. 
he had a magnetic flywheel located at the castle that is still there and parts of it had been removed. When Ed didn't get a patent, he was very open about the plans for it and supposedly, supposedly, I hate when people say supposedly, (laughs) supposedly used it to power a truck as well. If you look at Ed's statements, he said that you simply had the north and south of the magnets which chased each other. He said that he used this perpetual motion machine to help build the castle. From a September 25th, 2020 Gaia.com article called, quote, Who was the mysterious Ed Lead Scalman, creator of Coral Castle? The article states, quote, Adding to the mystery are the remnants of an electromagnetic device in a chamber beneath the castle. There, one finds wires wrapped around bottles and odd devices with magnets and chains appearing to resemble a generator of some sort. Next to the generator are two long metal poles reaching down beneath the ground, similar to the anode and cathode of a battery. In the middle of the device is a flywheel made of concrete and magnets and shaped like a four-leaf clover. Many people believe that this was a perpetual motion device based on claims from Ed's pamphlet Magnetic Currents. When one holds a compass to the device and cranks it, the compass needle spins, indicating the magnets are set opposite in polarity. So Ed talked a lot about what he called double helical magnetic interaction and reverse magnetism. Hmm. And he claims that he cured his... his uh, Tuberculosis. tuberculosis using magnets. I mean, he sounds like a genius. You know what I mean? He sounds like a like a a, a recluse. He, genius. No, he sounds like a um like Tesla. Yeah, that's like a genius, but is also kind of you know weird. Yeah, uh, like a, a few <laughs> fries short of a, a happy weird. Meal. Yeah, exactly. What's well, crazy to think is he. Potentially... But is it is it that that insanity that lets you exactly right or is it the they say that people who are super intelligent all you know you kind of have the potential oh to yeah my dad crazy. my dad used to say because he you know he went to uh he did stuff in california my dad did stuff everywhere but he yeah. he was he was working part of his time when he was in california at caltech and he said the people there that he met are at the same time some of the smartest and most stupid and just bizarre yeah, bizarre people that he's ever met mm-hmm. you it's, know so there, there's there's like a, a weird correlation between mm-hmm. genius and insanity it's like you know too much yeah. <laughs> and your yeah. brain can't handle yeah it. and i well, feel it's kind of what ed is like like a Ed's, little bit yep i think it's kind of crazy though that he potentially had knowledge that we could still be using today yeah. and tried to share that with yeah. the world and, yeah. and but the thing is like the, he talks about reverse magnetism Mm -hmm. and I kind of get that because if you can somehow charge these stones one way and you you can do something, yeah. And you can charge something else the opposite way. You could use that to like push. Absolutely. And that would kind of account for what the kids said when they saw him moving stuff, like they were balloons. Mm -hmm. So did he know something that we still don't know to this day? I don't know. And that we could be using Mm -hmm. that would be like some kind of breakthrough Mm -hmm. and, Ed also said in one of his booklets, as I said in the beginning, the North and South Pole magnets, they are the cosmic force. They hold together this earth and everything on it, and they hold together the moon too. The moon's north end holds South Pole magnets the same as the earth's north end. The moon's south end, hold, the moon's south end holds North Pole magnets the same as earth's south end. Those people who have been wondering why the moon does not crash down, all they have to do is give the moon one half a turn so that the north end would be on the south side, the south end on the north side, and then the moon would come crashing down, attracted to its, to, attracted to Earth. Well, at, obviously. At present, the Earth and the moon have like magnetic poles in the same side, so their own magnetic poles keep themselves apart. But when the poles are reversed, then they will pull together. Here's a good tip to the rocket people. Make the rocket's head a strong north pole magnet and the tail end a strong south pole magnet and then shoot onto the moon's north end and you will have better success. Hmm. So he says that the earth and the moon are kept apart by the the diff, that their reverse magnetism. Hmm. It's holding them apart. So <laughs> I don't know. Dude was big in a magnet. I really wrap my head around that, but Dude, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's also the theory that where he was, ley lines, like ley hmm. lines are also yes. a theory that ley lines are supposedly lines of energy that circle the earth where you can do things that you normally can't do and they're just lines of like a power and like activities and activity yeah like weird paranormal stuff. activity yeah. and yeah i mean it's i don't know complicating the issues are joe bullard's 2000 book titled waiting for agnes it's a novel that is quote inspired by the story of coral castle bullard spent 16 years researching for the book but it's hard to know what is fact and what is fiction in the novel 
According to a Medium.com article, one of the things that you find in a novel is that, quote, supposedly Ed's mother had gone to a psychic in Latvia who told her that Ed had lived before with a girl in Atlantis and that after he was born, he would have dreams and visions of this place and bring back some of its secrets. Ed supposedly did have many visions of Atlantis where he was a sculptor and there was a girl who was maybe Agnes, or rather that Agnes was a reincarnation of. Ed had a strong connection to the pyramid builders and he claimed that they had come from Atlantis where they where there had been aliens as well as humans. <clears throat> so there's that. But we don't there's know that. if that's something that was made up for the novel or if that was something that showed up in the research. Right. Uh, there's also the fact that since Ed came from a family of stonemasons, masons, <laughs> That Ed came from a family of stonemasons. <laughs> Since Ed had come from a family of stonemasons, Ed was himself a Freemason. And you know, there's I all sorts. If that was there are all sorts of things about Freemasons. Mm -hmm. To this day, a lot of people believe that Freemasons are some sort of mystical sect. But we'll have an episode on that in a future date because we do, we have to do one about Freemasonry because that's kind of a big thing. I found out. Um, a lot, a neighbor that I grew up ne next to my whole entire life passed away last he year. He was a Freemason. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I never yeah. would have known that. Coral Castle does have Freemason symbolry. Symbolry. Coral Castle does have Freemason symbols throughout it. And there are reports of neighbors hearing what sounded like Ed chanting and doing incantations over the stones at night while he was working on the castle. So there's that. Another one you see thrown up a lot. Aliens. Hmm. Aliens somehow helped him. Through anti-gravity. That's one of the theories is that aliens gave him the secrets of anti-gravity. I don't know. <laughs> he asked nicely. I don't know. They were helping him get Agnes back. I, I maybe. Know. Maybe they were suckers for romance. A love story. Anyway, suckers, for suckers for a good love for story. Suckers for a good love story. Gave Ed the secrets of anti-gravity. Ed and Agnes. Get, Ed and Agnes. They're like the Jim and Pam <laughs> of weirdness. Is that the office? Yeah, that's okay. the office. <laughs> Uh, and there's theories about sound manipulation. People report hearing him sing or hum while he was working at night on the castle. So they think somehow he was able to manipulate sound hmm. and you move the rocks by it that. Sounds like Some people said there. they think he had telekinetic powers. I mean, that's possible. You know, and a lot of people even believe that there's a hidden cipher in his booklets and tracks written by him that is just waiting to be found to reveal his secrets. Hmm. So I don't know. That would be cool. Yeah. Although he tried to reveal them, it yeah. sounds like. And a couple things, like a, a couple things, popped up on Quora, which is where people ask questions and random people on the internet answer them. Uh, one of them I came across was about how this was built, and one Quora user said, "When when to, when one talks about Coral Castle, there are some very interesting issues to consider. We can claim that it was all done with simple tools using the art of leverage and expertise in stones, but no one has even completed the very first step Edward performed, removing a 10 by 10 by 3 foot stone weighing close to 8 tons from a rock deposit. The sto these stones have 90 degree corners, meaning that limestone cannot be breached. It had to be cut out, and Ed only went in and having one side exposed on these stones. All of these people preaching their theories just perform this initial feat with what Ed started in his home using tools only obtained from the local junkyard. Uh, one can view his stones and there are no chips made from levers or scrapes. Which, Where did he get the stones from again? A quarry, just like okay, a random quarry, like quarry around there. Okay. But uh, what this guy said kind of makes sense that there's mm -hmm. no scrapes. And if you're prying these stones out, you think there would be more scrapes on them from prying them out of the ground and... I don't Is know. limestone a really hard stone? It's we'll get it. We'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> I just got curted. Yeah, it was the curted. first time in the yeah, whole episode. We're an hour and twelve minutes point. in, and that's pretty good. So I'm going to end the paranormal theories with a weird one that I ended up going deep down a rabbit hole about, and okay. this also came from Quora, where to that same question about how Ed did this, somebody wrote, "Quote: Coral Castle was built by the brain slash entity in a box, which the little Japanese-like alien girl brought to Earth in her spaceship on February 22nd, 1803. Of course. Which the Japanese people who found her believed contained her lover's severed head. She would not allow anyone near the box to see what was inside of it. She held onto it tightly. If this was the same box used by the gentleman from Florida to build his park, Coral Castle, from heavy blocks cut from coral, then I would say, yes, yes it is. It works as good as what the Egyptian used to build the pyramids. See the pics below with the mysterious box on top of the tripod. No one has ever found this box. It may be the same box that the alien girl is holding in the picture directly below. The man who built Coral Castle waited and waited for this alien girl to return, but she never returned before he died. He built Coral Castle for her. 
So that I read that. Made I up. read that and I was like, what? So then I went down that rabbit hole and there is something called Atsuro Boon, a Japanese legend. Okay. This comes directly from Wikipedia. Quote, on February 22nd, 1803, local fishers in the Hira Adori shore in the Hitachi province, Hitachi province, 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 saw an ominous ship drifting in the waters. Curious, they towed the vessel back to land, discovering that it was 11 feet high and 18 feet wide. Its upper part appeared to be made of red-coated rosewood, while the lower part was covered with bronze plates, obviously to protect it against the sharp edge rocks. The upper part had several windows made of glass or crystal, covered with bars and clogged with some kind of strange tree resin. The windows were completely transparent, and the baffled fishermen looked inside. The inside of the Utsurubun was decorated with text written in a strange, unknown language. The fishermen found items inside, such as two bedsheets, a bottle filled with water, some cake, and some kneaded meat. Then the fishermen saw a beautiful young woman, possibly 18 or 20 years old and 5 feet tall. The woman had red hair and red eyebrows, her hair elongated by artificial white extensions. The extensions could have been made of white fur or thin white powdered textile streaks. This hairstyle cannot be found in any literature. The skin of the lady was a very pale pink color. She wore precious, long, and smooth clothing of unknown fabrics. The woman began speaking, but nobody could understand her. She did not seem to understand the fisherman either, so no one could ask her where she came from. Although the mysterious woman appeared friendly and courteous, she acted oddly, for she always clutched a box made of pale material around 24 inches to her side. The woman would not allow anyone to touch the box, no matter how kindly or pressingly the person asked. One of the theories was that this girl was maybe a faraway princess who carried this severed head of her murdered lover in the box, but there's a lot of speculation about whether the girl was really an alien and maybe the box contained some kind of energy source that powered her craft. Why would they go to severed head? I don't know. Like, that's not the I, first thing I'm thinking about. I don't know. Maybe there's a cake in there. You I don't, don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but she would not let people look in this box. And I mean, I wouldn't want to show people if I had a severed head either, but... but yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Please don't carry a severed head. <laughs> I just you know, feel like a, that's not the first thing that would come to mind. <laughs> in a box. Maybe there were donuts in there. Um, I don't know. But, she just didn't but want to people share speculate donuts. that what she had in the box was what powered her weird ship thing. And people think that the box that is on top of the winch that Ed used to build Coral Castle might be one and the same, or it holds a similar power source. That's a stretch. Yeah, it's a stretch. He had but, a box. It must be a severed I was head. fascinated going down that rabbit hole about, about the alien girl and the her her box. I see no connection. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Moving on. We get to theory number two. It was nothing paranormal. You know, Ed didn't help matters, really. When asked about how he managed to do it all by himself, he would sometimes answer that he just understood physics and leverage really well. There you and go. other times he would say he did it by using the secret of the ancient pyramids. He's quoted as Which saying... Which was like leverage He's and... quoted as saying, quote, <laughs> I have discovered the secrets of the pyramids and have found how the Egyptians and ancient builders in Peru, the Yucatan and Asia, with only primitive tools, raised and set in place blocks of stone weighing many tongue, tongues. Many tons. But the secrets of the ancient pyramids could just mean physics. It could mean leverage. It could mean mm -hmm. they knew how to do this. You right. know, I'm. I love the magnetism theory. Yeah, I do too. I can buy it. Yeah, you know, and, and people say he just did this all using levers, winches, and coral is porous. I mean, it's, it took him twenty years. He yeah, didn't do this in twenty days. Coral is porous. It's still heavy, but if you weigh an equal size block of coral and a block of limestone or granite that was used to build a pyramid, the coral will weigh considerably less, but it's still tons. I mean, I think that's. Right. I think that makes no difference. A ton it's still, of coral is yeah, still a it's ton still of coral. a ton. Yeah. The door, for example, was a huge stone gate that opened and closed way too easily for being a rock. But when it jammed up in the 80s, workers found that a metal shaft and bearing were behind the quote-unquote magic. But in Ed's defense, even with modern technology to fix the door, it doesn't swing as easily as it did when it was originally built. And then you get to Wally Wallington. Wally Wallington <laughs> is a retired construction worker that lives in Michigan. He's created a Stonehenge-like structure using just physics and common tools. According to Wikipedia, quote, his techniques use simple machines such as levers aided by counterweights and pivots. He says that he has successfully single-handedly walked a 20-ton stone and multi-thousand pound concrete blocks using a beam lever and two pivots beneath the object and near the center of its mass. 
These techniques might be comparable to those used by Edward Leet Scanlon when he'd single-handedly constructed his massive coral castle in Florida. So basically, he just knew what he was doing from all his years working as a, as a stonemason, and he used leverage and winches and mechanical means to quarry, shape, and move the stones, and basically, he just worked his butt off. Mm-hmm. I, like I said, I have not here, remember, this took 20 years. Yeah. You can do a lot in 20 years. Right. You can do what seems like the impossible. Yeah, because... Very slowly yeah, in 20 yeah, years. Yeah, 20 years is a long time. It's a really long time. So... So that's those did are he the have t- a job. <laughs> no, apparently not. This is all he did. That's huh? all he did. But right. the thing is, he only did it at night. You know, it's not like he was working twenty four seven. He only did it at night. It's still twenty uh, years though. According to an article on LiveScience dot com from two thousand six, the article says, "quote." Many mystery mongers arrogantly assume that those living in earlier times, such as Ed or the ancient Egyptians, were not clever or resourceful enough to possibly have created impressive engineering feats without extraterrestrial aid or mysterious powers. This view betrays an ignorance of history and sadly underestimates human ingenuity. It seems likely that if scientists haven't explained the Coral Castle specifically, it's because there's little to explain. The Coral Castle mystery just seems to be simply a matter of poorly informed people who reject a mundane reality in favor of a fanciful myth. And then there's some speculation that the whole story about Agnes Scruff might not be 100% true. When asked why he had built the castle, Leed Scanlon would just say it was for his Sweet Sixteen. But in Ed's own publication called A Book in Every Home, he implies that his Sweet Sixteen might have been more an ideal than a reality. Hmm. According to some other accounts, the girl did actually exist, but her name was actually Hermione. So, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe magic? They had wands? Maybe. Stuff. I don't know. So He's a muggle, so, so those I can see how that wouldn't work out. Before we get to the what do you think, a bit of trivia. In the 1961 film Nude on the Moon... Two scientists travel to the moon where they discover a civilization of topless female extraterrestrials led by a moon queen with telepathic powers. Of course. The film features the smash hit song, I'm Mooning Over You, My Little Moon Doll. And for the scenes on the moon, the producers filmed at Coral Castle. Wow. And in the name of research, just because I love you guys, I watched the film on YouTube and it was actually really cool seeing Hmm. Coral Castle back in the day and their scenes set at the gate, at the stone gate. And there's lots of boobs, but there's the, there's the, there's the. Taking one for the team. I, yeah. I didn't want to watch it, but I felt I had to, but it, it was seriously research. really interesting to see scenes at Coral Castle yeah. pretending. Back to, when it was like a th- Yeah. Pretending a to be the moon. And it was neat to see the, the scenes at the rock gate. So there you go. Well, he probably made a little cash from that. Oh, I'm sure he probably did. And got to see a bunch of boobs. I was just going to say, probably <laughs> got to stay on personal. set. Yeah. <laughs> So what do you think? Hmm. Do you think? I think there's nothing mystical or paranormal about it. I think he was just really smart and figured out a way to do things. And maybe it's a method that kind of got lost and buried with him that we could use today. But I still don't think there's anything mystical about it. But him moving that 20 foot tall tower. Like I I, I don't do know. know he did it alone. That's yeah, I'm sure he did. I don't know. He did it, so I, I just think, I don't know. To me, there's got to be a, a like, you know, like a normal mundane explanation. I, I buy the magnetic stuff. I really do. You know, like that's the tower. Like how did one... That's pretty big. How did one man do that? How was he able to... Again, how did the there's just There's happen? so many people that say there is no way he was able to make these... To quarry these and to make them perfect blocks where they're so perfectly fit together that there is no light coming in between the seams. I I, I don't know. I keep possible. I keep alternating back and forth between there's something he had something. You know, and here is I'll show you this. Uh, I do think that kind of construction is possible though because that's how people made. Things yeah, but when you when you have modern people with diamond tipped equipment they should be trying it the way he probably can't did manage it. to do it there's a picture of his tripod with the box on the top oh there's definitely a severed head in there <laughs> so that people, is a huge box it is but people suspect that that box is what holds whatever allowed him to do all this i'm skeptical i'm 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 torn but i i don't know i don't know there's just there's, occam's razor There's probably a really simple explanation. And to me, it's somewhere between the magnetism and the pulleys and the levers because, and 
meticulous detail and, and the knowledge and skill to do that kind of craftsmanship. I think he had some means to help him do it. I don't know what it is. Maybe it is magnetism. Bigfoot? It could be Bigfoot. <laughs> I just don't. I just Mothman. I it might have been big Mothman and Yeti, like yeah. on our caps. The I don't know. I feel like duo. I just feel like that's too much work for this little scrawny dude. Over twenty years, though. Yeah, but that tower. How are you going to move? And his wind. It said they said they didn't think his winch could move over ten tons, and some of this stuff is over thirty tons. Hmm. So how did he do that? I don't know. I don't I, know. I'm. I'm. I don't know. I want to be skeptical on this one, but I just don't can't know. Quite get there. I can't quite get there. I think he knew something. Maybe it wasn't some weird magnetic well, thing, but I feel like perpetual motion machine. Yeah, and his perpetual motion machine. Maybe that helped. You know, did maybe that's... it runs on the blood of severed heads. <laughs> you really latched onto that girl <laughs> carrying a severed it's head just in a so box. So ridiculous. <laughs> but I mean, I just see uh, no connection. There's there. there's lots of you know talk that that actually did happen i mean that's not like a legend that the girl thing actually mm. did happen i don't know why it's connected to this story though because of the box <laughs> because you know i don't think there's a severed head I'm in having the box, like a seven moment but if, <laughs> what's, in the box? what's in the box but the it's but severed maybe head. she did have the whatever powered her ship in that box i'm strangely not as skeptical on this one as i usually am yeah. like i feel like there's something hinky something like he it. knew something i don't know I get that too. I just don't know that I buy that whatever he knew was some kind of mystical thing. I don't, I don't know. But, uh, it probably uh, seems mystical because that knowledge never got shared with us. No, yeah. I Maybe mean, he figured out a way to harness something that exists. Did he figure out how to do perpetual motion and, and that was actually could be used as a motor? I mean, think of when we first started using electricity. That probably seemed like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Like this guy, you know, he just probably figured out some new... But if he figured it out, why didn't Innovation. he tell people what he figured out? He he tried to get it patented, though, didn't yeah. he? Yeah, he did. So who has that information? I don't know. I don't know. The Illuminati. But, uh, Josh's <laughs> pictures are fascinating. Like, his pictures are so cool. So you can actually go on tour the place, probably for more than 25 cents, but... I don't remember if he said how much it is, but Maybe I mean, it's that's free. a lot of Holy stuff. Holy moly. Yeah. It's and like a city's grown up around it. it yeah. Looks like. like it's big. I mean, wow. it's not just a couple like the, like the. Uh, and there's like concrete or bricks or something down now. Or is that sand? I, is I that the, sand? I'm not, I think that might be sand. Okay. But look at all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot for one dude to move. One scrawny, 100 pound, five foot tall dude. Yeah. I, I'm not saying he carried it, but. I don't know. To put it together so precisely. We're, we're, we're on opposite sides we on are. this one. Opposite sides of the table and <laughs> the topic. Opposite sides of the spectrum. <laughs> so yeah, I think there's something weird to it. Krista doesn't. What do you guys think? I mean, I can't explain it. I just don't know that the explanation is... Please don't send us a severed head in a box. <laughs> <laughs> like seriously? Um, yeah, that would be really yeah, traumatic. <laughs> so let us know what you guys think about both of these stories. Yeah. Let us know what is you guys think. Dudley Town a dud? Is Have Dudley you been Town? there? I, I want to go. I want to. Coral Castle's on my bucket list. I would love mm. to see Coral it would Castle. Be cool. uh, it would be cool to do a road trip to visit a variety of things that we've talked about. Maybe on the show. if we ever get our, our Patreon where we watch movies, we'll watch Nude on the Moon. <laughs> People can watch that. I mean, there's a couch and a TV and a DVD player right there. So we probably could make this happen. Yep. So let us know what you guys think. Yeah. I'm, we'll do a song and then. A, do a question? A question. And question a, first or a the joke. song? Let's do a question first. Question first. I'm going to do two jokes while you're looking them up. Laugh out loud jokes for kids. We got this down to a science we note. Do. It took us five seasons, but... Well, we're going to totally change things for six se- season yeah, six. Um, how do you make a hot dog stand? With wood? Take away its chair. Wow. What kind of balls don't bounce? What kind of eyeballs how do we know maybe they, they, they do, do. i'm i'm just gonna finish this page why can't you play hide and seek with mountains why they're always peeking <laughs> that one's cute oh, one pickle joke i'm only reading one pickle joke jope <laughs> come on doctor examining his patient My heavens, you must be upset. There's a cucumber growing out of your head. Patient, of course I'm upset. I planted corn. (laughs) Jeez. I don't even. I just can't even. 
That was loud. <laughs> okay, ready? I'm ready. We'll do two questions. It only took 20 minutes. Shut up. <laughs> I will end you. <laughs> 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 Question one. What is your favorite funny movie? Uh, I go right to Dazed and Confused. I, I mean... I go to Caddyshack. Oh, you're a dude. You would say that. That's like Jim's <laughs> favorite funny movie, too. You'll get nothing in like it's It's a combination of funny and nostalgia, because I remember watching that an when absurdity. I was a kid. And it's such a good movie. It's so yeah, funny. Yeah, Chevy Chase is in his prime. Yes, it's so Caddyshack. funny. So I would my, my go-to is Caddyshack. Caddyshack. I mean, I've I watched it Caddyshack. several times because yep. he's a fan. Dazed and Confused, I don't think it's super funny. There's just so many good one-liners that There's make a good me one laugh But I don't loud. really think of it as a comedy. Mm, I find a lot of humor in it, I guess. We agree to disagree. And you love that movie. I do love that movie, but I just, I see it more as a period piece. (laughs) (laughs) A period piece. It is a period piece. It's set in the 70s. Yes, it's true. Okay. Next question. That was the first thing that came to mind. Thank you, anonymous person. Yeah. Last question. Parks and Rec reference. Describe your perfect treat yourself day. That's such a great show. Never um, seen it. <clears throat> Treat it. yourself. I need to um, watch it. Oh, it's so good. You I know. Would Sophie, I think love it. It? Sophie tells me I need to watch that. It's so good. Um, perfect treat yourself day. So like a like a do so for them it was like going to the salon and like get whatever getting your nails. And just, stuff I think done a perfect and buy, spending a perfect, lots and lots a of money. Perfect day. I took it as just like a perfect day. Yeah. Hmm. Perfect day. My perfect relaxing day. Perfect day for me is not having any obligations or plans. I just feel like that's so rare now that having a full day from start to finish where I can just do whatever I want. I can lounge and drink coffee in the morning. Yep. Like if we want to go out for lunch, we'll go out for lunch. Like no plan. Go thrift, thrift, you know, thrift shopping or whatever. Like that's our thing. Come home, have a relaxing dinner, play our I, video game. Like We're that. really into Diablo uh, 3 right now. Nice. It's probably like so 2000 and whatever, but. <laughs> nice. I love that we have a game that we yeah. both like playing together. It is cool. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's To me, the perfect day is not having a plan. I get that. Not mine, having to go anywhere or do anything. Mine would be like that too. Mm-hmm. No, pl- no obligations. Yep. But mine would just be get up in the morning, play some video games that I'm, you know, liking that I'm hooked on currently playing some of the video games. Lunch with a friend or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, good lunch at maybe a pub or a bar. Have a couple beers. Get home. Go for a walk by myself in the woods. Listen to some podcasts. Listen to some music. And maybe watch a couple TV shows at and night. Like PJ time. PJ time is... <laughs> my PJ time is so early. <laughs> Me too. Like yeah. we get home from work, yeah. we eat dinner, and it's PJ yeah. time. Like. <laughs> But that, that would PJs? be my that would be my treat yourself day. Just a nice yeah. laid back day. Like, like a that. totally routine, yeah. normal day. day of just doing whatever you feel like yeah. doing. Because it just seems like such a rarity. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Cool. Good yeah. questions. Thank you guys. Yeah. Cool. Uh song time. Song time. We are doing we're mixing it up a little bit here. We are. I told Krista, I notified Krista. Mm-hmm. He gave me notice. That we are. He's leaving the show. To mix I'm it. I'm done with the show. This is my last show, folks. So that what you heard earlier, that's a taste of what's to come, people. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, Kurt is not leaving the I'm show. I'm not leaving the show. No. We, no, 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 we no. have to tell people when we're joking. I yeah. Think. No. And uh, because I, I figured to mix it up a little bit, we're going to do one of those 30-day song challenges. We'll do one each episode. So. Okay. Our question for today is, what is a favorite song of yours with a number in it? Mm-hmm. Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Okay. So <laughs> the song I chose is by the band Soul Coughing, which I've talked about before. I love Soul Coughing. They've been disbanded for years and years. But you listen to M. Doherty, so I know you're familiar with yeah. them. And you probably heard some Soul Coughing, too. Yeah. Barry, anyway. I know Barry <laughs> loves Soul Coughing. Oh, really? So she, she used to make me CDs, and she'd put a lot of Soul Coughing that. in there. Yep. I just love her even more now. So this song is off of their Irresistible Bliss album, which is, I think it's their second album. Ruby Vroom, I think, was their first, which is such a good, they're both amazing albums. Anyway, the song is called Four Out of Five. And there's nothing really, it's not profound or anything, but just the lyrics are kind of clever. 
and it's the sort of uh, chorus that's going to stick with you. You're going to hear it once, and it's going to be running through your head the rest yeah. of the day, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. But I just <laughs> Like love... you and I today with On the Wings of oh Love. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> which we thankfully didn't, got that out we of thankfully my head, didn't sing during the episode. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's bassy. It's like, I just, everything I love about soul coughing. They're just a little edgy, and there's something really cool and poetic Sweet. about their music. I'm excited so. to listen to that Four one. Four out of five by I'm soul I'm excited coughing. to listen to that one. Mine is actually by a band that I did another song from, uh, the Canadian band Broken Social Scene, which I really, really like. They have a song called... You're not I, sure. I don't know how to... It's called... It's like the fraction. It's seven slash four. Okay. It's called Seven Fourths Shoreline. Okay. And I believe the seven slash four stands for that... Stands for the time... The musical time that the song is in. Oh, like three which, quarter time. Uh, or, Jamie, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jamie, or David. Both of you guys are way into music, mm-hmm. and you'll know if that's what I'm talking about is true. That it's seven fourths time. Mm-hmm. I guess it's a tricky time signature to do a song to. Mm-hmm. But they do this song, and I absolutely love this song. I love a couple seconds into the song when the drums start. I love. There's something about the drum beat the time signature of the drums that I absolutely love. Okay. And I believe that's the seven fourths. Okay. But it is the song seven fourth shoreline by broken social scene. And we will put videos to these on our uh, YouTube page. On our YouTube page. (laughs) We actually do have a YouTube page. We do. (laughs) So I didn't just make that up, but I've never actually said we're going to put anything on YouTube before. So now let's do a tarot. Facebook. Let's do a tarot reading. A tarot? A tarot. A tarot reading. You caught me off guard. What? Oh, I hope that's not bad. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> Speaking of magnets, <laughs> want to stick? Do you have your laptop on? Yeah, I, I can turn it on. Hold on, let me stop. <laughs> oh my god! Well, this is why you don't want Krista running the show <laughs> because we just have been talking for a good ten minutes, and I realized that we weren't recording anymore. Yeah. You have to explain what happened with the magnet. This is what threw me off. That's why I stopped recording because I went to grab the tarot deck, that, which that, is like which this is, little deck that has like a little book in it and some cards. It's a magnetic seal. And yeah, it had, the little container closes with a magnet. And when I picked it up, the thumb drive that we use was stuck to it. And I was terrified that I just deleted everything that's The thumb on drive here. that we put our episodes on to transfer in between her computer and my computer. And it's like, oh my God, did we erase stuff on there? But we didn't, I don't think. We just didn't record our conversation. We just didn't record our conversation about the tarot reading. So but we did a tarot poll. Yep, you can explain the tarot reading. Just explain what happened. Yeah. So we asked the question, Kurt's students are going to be returning to in-person school mm-hmm. next week. And so we just week wanted after to next. ask. Oh, week yep. after next. We just wanted to ask how that was going to go. And I pulled the Ace of Pentacles. I explained to Kurt that I'm learning that Pentacles usually mean material goods or money, things like that. Um, and Ace is usually the beginning of something. And that's basically what the card yeah. said that you you're at the beginning of something that could be very lucrative. Yeah. And that you should do whatever you need to to manifest your goals. Yeah. And Kurt hinted that it might that's, that's actually, that's ca- kind actually of accurate. really accurate. So. But then we also talked about how I was disheartened because there's a billboard that McDonald's janitors make more money than I do currently. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how I'm worried about my money situation. And then we realized that we weren't recording. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there was a lot of joking about Kurt living in my basement too. (laughs) Yes. And pooping in a bucket. (laughs) Pooping in a bucket. He missed a lot of bucket poop comments. (laughs) I'm realizing how ridiculous that was. <laughs> anyway, maybe I shouldn't have recorded. Yeah, maybe that. maybe you didn't record that for a reason. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Any hoozles. And our deets, <laughs> you can email us at the strange sessions at gmail.com. We are on Twitter at strange session without the S. Krista's doing a great job on Instagram and we're really getting a lot of Instagram followers. Yeah, we have like six hundred and six now. And I realize in the like podcast world that's like two people. We're influencers. We're <laughs> social media influencers, basically. Yeah. Uh, she, I basically just steal stuff from our Facebook page and post it there. She does a great job on Instagram at The Strange Sessions. You can send us postcards and snail mail and taste test items now within reason. No like severed said, heads. No severed heads. <laughs> Don't eat half of a Fiber One bar and throw in an envelope thinking we're going to finish it. Gross. But you can send those to The Strange Sessions mm. at P.O. Box 434, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, 54221-0434. 
And you can call our lonely little phone line at 920-443-9602. And a lot of people have emailed us lately and, yeah. and, and gave us stories to use for a future listener stories episode. So when are we going to do that? Sometime this season. We should probably... So people start thinking about what you want to share with yeah, us. Yeah, sometime in the, in the near future ish you can send it to us now too you yeah. don't have to wait yeah, until if you we got a story it. you want us to read feel free to send it now and we'll i'll put it in the bank with all the rest yep and i think that's it mm-hmm. anything else you would like to say no no <laughs> no i'm done <gasps> she's done with this um drop the mic i'm gonna leave it in its little boom but you're still gonna drop stand. it yeah okay and i'm gonna metaphorically drop the mic <laughs> metaphorically mic because i don't want to buy a new one but I think that's it. Yeah, I, think I so feel too. like there was something else we were going to say, and I'll remember it when I'm down the block. Hey, we named our studio. I feel like that's the strange is cellar. The strange cellar. So now we have to like get a banner or something. I'm actually, because I'm going here. down by Aaron's now in West Bend, I'm actually going to drive past the old school. So I'll Aww. swing up in the parking lot and see if anybody's there. Flip them the bird. <laughs> so yeah, probably all the Navy cadets. Suck it, cadets. Probably taking pot shots at me with their guns and right. whatnot. They're fake wooden guns. Yeah. I still remember that day that guy came over yeah. to ask us for our ID. The child with, you know, <laughs> his fake gun wanted our ID. We don't run into that here. No. No, just Lucy. <laughs> yeah. But if you and Jim need something to do today, Nude on the Moon is on YouTube. So if you do want to watch the Nude on the Moon movie. I highly doubt that that's going to happen. Well, if, if you do, let me know what Jim you think. Jim would probably be into it. I, I'll he's probably seen that it. out there. He's yeah, probably, he's probably like, oh, I've seen this already. <laughs> so I think from Krista and I in the strange cellar, Woo-hoo. until next time, stay, stay strange. strange.